We're going to talk about the universe. Where did the seeds of structure in the universe come from? So let's begin by just looking at galaxies. If we look outside of our own Milky Way, tens of millions of light years, and look at distant galaxies, they're doing something really strange. They're moving apart from one another. All the galaxies are moving apart. They're moving apart from us, and the further they are away from us, the faster they're moving apart. And when you interpret that, it's in terms of a universe that's expanding, that the space between the galaxies is stretching due to the expansion of the universe. In fact, the universe is actually accelerating today. It's going faster and faster, and we would like to know why. When you turn the clock back, it gives you a universe that's about 13.7 billion years old. And this beautiful picture is remarkable. Every dot in this picture is a galaxy. Every dot has about 200 billion stars in it. Where did this structure come from? What were the seeds which led to a universe that looks like this when you look back about two billion years? Now, this structure is, looks fairly uniform. There are holes and then there are filaments where all the galaxies are clustered together. They're not randomly distributed. And what we want to know is where did that come from? And this property of the universe called homogeneity means we're in no special place. In the early universe, it was bathed with hot radiation from the primordial Big Bang. As atoms began to form, this, un this radiation was released and propagated to, to us today. And this simulation is, an, is a, a map of the observable universe. And in it, you can see that the green tells you that the radiation is at a uniform temperature. It's about two degrees Kelvin, two degrees above absolute zero. That's really cold. Ice freezes at 273 degrees Kelvin. Now, what's strange about this isn't just that it's nice and green. That's a problem for the hot Big Bang theory. The blue dots which I've added there, that was the size of the observable region of a universe when this radiation was released, which was about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. But you can see the three dots cannot have known about each other's existence at that moment. So how come the universe that we see today is so uniform? How, how important are we in the universe? In terms of raw material, sadly, we're not very important. We're made up of atoms. Atoms constitute about 5% of the total energy budget of the universe. 23% or so is made up of an elusive substance called dark matter. This is some kind of material that we don't yet know what it is that interacts it doesn't interact with light, barely interacts at all, and we can only infer it from looking at its gravitational properties by seeing how it deflects light going past it, by seeing how it affects the dynamics of galaxies. And then you've got this really weird substance called dark energy. We don't know what that is, hence we call it dark energy. But it's driving the current acceleration of the universe. And one of the goals that we have is to try and understand the makeup of our universe. I'm from Yorkshire, and in Yorkshire, we know lots of things. And in fact, we do know what dark matter is, and I now know why we've not been able to find it. Dark matter, you see, is created using the prime elements of the universe. That makes sense. But it's a dark mild with big malt roast flavors. We've been using the wrong detectors. We should be tasting the, uh, uh, the universe to see what dark matter is. A universe which is smooth everywhere, homogeneous and isotropic, looks the same in all directions, can have three basic shapes. It can be like a, a closed sphere, it can be like an open saddle, and it can be like a flat sheet of paper, depending upon how much energy there is in the universe. Our universe today appears very much as if it's like this flat sheet of paper. So that's fine. That's what it looks like. What does that tell me about the early universe? If I work out what, what it must have looked like say, a second after the universe began, then it has to be flat to 15 decimal places. That's remarkable fine-tuning in the early universe, something that we need to understand. It's an initial condition problem. Before we go on to discuss the beginnings, let's just have a quick summary of where we're at. Here we are today, 13.7 billion years after the universe began. It's accelerating because of this elusive dark energy. 
If I go back in time, a few billion years ago, I have planets and galaxies being able to form. And if I go back further, I come back to this region here, about 300, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when this cosmic microwave background radiation, the one that's so smooth today, was released. And that's going to prove a vital probe for us in understanding the origin of the seeds of structure in the universe. And the bit we're about to concentrate on is this phenomenal region here, where we think the universe underwent a period of incredibly rapid acceleration. And that was called inflation. Why do we need to do that? I've said the universe is homogeneous and isotropic, but there's structures in there on all sorts of scales, and we need to understand the origin of this structure. And this is where I enter the inflationary universe, bring you to this, this beautiful idea. There are a number of people who are credited with it. Here are three of the main protagonists. And what is the idea? The idea is simple. If, remember I told you that the universe is beautifully smooth on large scales, that uniform background temperature. How can I get that? Well, if in the very early universe, about 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang, let's have a quick pause here. That's really early, okay? If there was a small enough region where the photons in that region had time to thermalize and reach the same temperature, so if I could then expand that small region incredibly rapidly, then at later times our own observable universe would be absorbed within it. Okay, and therefore it would be at the same temperature. Starting from this initial region, I expand by a factor of a billion, billion, billion times, like Carl Sagan, in about 10 to the minus 33 seconds. This is rapid. This is the essence of the inflationary universe. I need something that can do that. To do that, you need something that is effectively like anti-gravity. It's a substance that has a negative pressure is required. It solves lots of issues doing this because it immediately gets rid of all the inhomogeneities that are present and it flattens out the universe. So the universe may be curved, but it's flat as far as we can see. We're used to this idea, right? The Earth looks flat to us. This is an image that we took on holiday. It could be the Mediterranean until you look at the tourists and this person's still got his socks on and this sign rather than saying Mediterranean seafood says fish and chips £4.95. So you're in Britain. Where does we get the inflation from? The, the tool of the trade for cosmologists is called a scalar field. What's a scalar field? A scalar field is a quantity that's just got a value and doesn't have a direction. You're used to scalars, quantities. You think of the temperature. Temperature in a room has got a value, but not a direction. The voltage across a battery has got a value, but not a direction. And so in cosmology, we use this scalar field, which we call phi, and it has an energy associated with it. And the crucial thing is this potential energy. It's like the energy you have when you're at the top of a hill, right? That's your potential energy. Now, it turns out if the potential energy is dominating over everything else and, the, and it's flat enough, then this will cause a region of negative pressure. It will dominate all the energy in the universe and it will cause it to accelerate. So this field then gradually works its way down the hill as if you, just like you are, like you would go down a hill and it quickens up and when it re exits this shaded region, it quickens up and inflation stops. And then the universe is empty of everything, but we're here. So we need to reheat the universe, we need to recreate the particles, and you do it by converting this energy into particles as it oscillates down at the bottom of its potential here. Now on top of that is the crucial thing which leads to structure. That is, this field which is evolving also has fluctuations associated with it. They're called quantum fluctuations. You have quantum fluctuations inside you. All your atoms are fluctuating, but they're minuscule. You're not noticing it. But when the universe is accelerating and it grabs hold of these quantum fluctuations, it does something very special. It stretches them. It stretches them to cosmological scales, pulls them outside of our observable region and freezes them in as they couple to the curvature of our universe. Then much later on, they come back within our observable universe again, but they're frozen. They're the same imprint as we had at the very earliest moments. So what we're seeing when these fluctuations come back in on the large scales is an imprint of the physics of 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. 
That's amazing. How do we discover this? We go back to our favorite candidate, the cosmic microwave background. I said it was so smooth as discovered by Penzias and Wilson in 1965, but we now know there are fluctuations on top. And as the photons of light experience these fluctuations, they either get hotter or colder, and they lead to slight deviations away from that smooth background. These deviations were first detected by the COBE satellite in 1992, which led to two Nobel Prizes. Penzias and Wilson got Nobel Prizes. You see the area to work in here? In 2003, the Nobel, uh, hasn't been awarded the Nobel Prize, the WMAP satellite was sent up and measured these fluctuations to incredible precision. This is just a staggering map. This is a map of the fluctuations, the primordial fluctuations, having got rid of all the forward contaminations like our own galaxy. You see the hot and the cold spots. These, this is an imprint of the early universe. It's an imprint, in case of inflation, of the inflationary model. The magnitude of these fluctuations are a few millionths of a degree Kelvin. Okay, the ratio is about one part in 100,000. It's like measuring the height of Everest to about nine centimeters. It contains important information. Stephen Hawking's already been there. If you look closely, you see SH in the, in the map. <laughs> and then it leads to the formation of structure. And we can see this through this simulation. I've started this simulation with these very small initial fluctuations that have come from inflation. Then Sir Isaac Newton, a local boy, does his work. Gravity starts pulling things into regions which have got a larger fluctuation, moving things away from things that have got a smaller fluctuation. And you can begin to see the filaments forming. You can begin to see the voids forming in the universe. And we're ending up with a universe that looks like our own. Where did the idea come from? The seed of the idea. It's a remarkable story. Alan Guth who's generally given credit for it, was walking along a corridor in 1978 when he overheard a seminar being given by a wonderful physicist called Robert Dickey. Dickey was explaining the flatness problem, why the universe had to be so flat. Alan Guth walked in, listened to the seminar, and it changed the face of cosmology because he realized this was a problem he needed to solve. So he set about it, and in 1980, he came up with the idea of inflation, he solved the flatness problem, but his own model wouldn't reheat the universe properly. It wasn't quite everything. And it generated many, many papers. Many people have followed on from here. In 1982, a number of them working in the field got together to think about how you generate these density fluctuations that seed the structures of the universe. They got together in Cambridge, where they made use of the machinery developed by a phenomenal local man called George Green. For those of you who live around Nottingham, you'll have no doubt seen this windmill in Stanton. George Green, formal education ended when he was eight. He had to run his father's windmill, and yet he taught himself mathematics at the kind of level that hadn't been developed at that stage. And yet the very mathematics he taught is the very mathematics you need for these fluctuation calculations. This is a summary slide of the talk given by Michael Turner at that 1982 meeting. And what I really like about it, it's a timeline from June 1982 through to July 1982. And he shows that initially there were two camps. One camp saying the fluctuations were too small and the other camp saying the fluctuations were too large. And this is how science develops. They had collaborations, they had seminars, they talked. They no doubt went down the pub and talked. And gradually, people went across from one camp to the other camp until they all finally agreed on the value of the density fluctuations. And this is what we now use today. And there are many models of inflation that we need to be able to constrain. And, we don't. and one of the goals that we have in the next generation of satellites is to try and constrain this. And the next generation that's out there now taking data is the Planck satellite. And what it's doing is with even more accuracy than WMAP has been able to measure, it's going to be measuring these microwave background fluctuations. Through that, it's going to be constraining models like the model of inflation. Hopefully, we'll be able to determine which, if any of the models are correct, and maybe none of them are correct, right? It maybe it needs something completely different. And through it, we'll be learning about the very earliest moments of the universe. I, they, 
keeping all of this data to themselves at the moment. It's going to be released next year. But I have a colleague here at Nottingham. We keep saying, no, what's the results? And he's, he won't tell us. He shuts his laptop every time I walk in. But it's too late. I know it's blue and red. Don't know where the spots are. And, but the other day, he injured himself playing football. And he was in the hospital. We went to see him. And he was on morphine. And he was speaking free as a bird. <laughs> and we forgot to ask him. <laughs> so there's a lesson there. But that's going to be our goal. Hopefully when this data is released in 2013, we'll have evidence of the earliest moments of the universe and maybe be able to say something about what happened in the first fractions that led to the structures that we see today. It's a very exciting time. Thank you.